for us to get over here and stuff. And like the gas is saying. Extraordinary powers require extraordinary government accountability. With all due respect to you, sir, to the questions put to you by my colleague, Mr. Motts, I do not accept your response that uh, Minister Mendocino uh, did not use his words appropriately when he's on record as stating that uh, law enforcement directed or asked for the use of the Emergencies Act. Your response was he chose the wrong set of words or he was misunderstood. Minister Mendocino is a senior government official. He's been a member of parliament for a significant period of time. He is a lawyer. Words matter. He spoke in the House numerous times. He gave speeches in the House numerous times, responded to questions, did press releases, went on television, and every time he did that, Mr. Stewart, he was consistent in his messaging that law enforcement asked for the use of the Emergencies Act. And it was only until law enforcement testifying at this committee and other committees flat out refuted that statement, did we hear a change in Minister Mendocino by stating they were consulting with law enforcement. My question to you is, were you yourself responsible or members of your office responsible in terms of giving Minister Mendocino those words that law enforcement asked for the Emergencies Act on numerous occasions? We don't script the minister, sir. Who does? The minister speaks for himself. The minister but prepares I do his was, own notes? I do believe he was misunderstood. Because when you say on the advice of law enforcement, the advice does not necessarily have to be about asking It them wasn't on the, the advice. Act. Listen to my question very carefully. He is on record, and I don't have enough time to repeat verbatim what he has stated on the record, that they asked for, law enforcement asked for the Emergencies Act. Not law enforcement consulted with the government as an option to deal with the, pro pro the protest, to deal with the invocation of the act, they had asked for it. If you knew he was misconstruing those words, why didn't you inform Mr. Uh, Minister Mendocino to clarify that in the House or to clarify that in the public? I'm not, uh, I serve the minister, and I'm not at liberty to discuss the advice I provide him, but I can tell you that I think he was misunderstood, and I believe that the intention that he was trying to express was that law enforcement asked for the tools that were contained in the Emergencies Act. So it wasn't just Minister Mendocino who was misconstrued or misunderstood. It was the Prime Minister. It was Minister Blair. It was Minister Lametti. It was probably members of the Liberal Caucus who all used that same talking point that law enforcement asked for it. Was the entire government misunderstood? Mr. Stewart, Canadians want transparency here. Who is giving directions to the government if it's not your department? Uh, Mr. Government. Chair, just on a point of order, I think this witness is here to testify with respect to public safety and the advice you would have given uh, to Minister Mendocino. He has the ability to answer the questions. He's been doing it quite capably all meeting. I don't think that question is relevant for, in terms well, of his expertise. I, I, I rule it in order and he can answer the question. The public service does not give direction to the government, sir. Was his enthusiasm the Conservatives have for this one issue? Uh, they and then can he turned around continue to talk about the personally intervene in conspiracy theories. We are going to stay focused on delivering yeah, for Canadians. I just want to say that these bureaucrats, they're stuck in between a rock and a hard place, and uh, really that they have to... Um, they, they, they just give advice, and it's it's the, the politicians who... Uh, you know what I mean? We should be focused on uh, the vitriol on. And this guy's just a witness. Check it out. Take for granted that we provided a number of legal opinions. I don't want to take for granted, Mr. Degler. If I want to take things for granted, I can read the act. But you're here as a witness. You're here to provide facts. Did you provide legal opinions? Yes or no? You can say you're not answering, but don't just say that that's how things generally go. I don't want expert opinion. I don't want the facts. 
So whether or not we produced an opinion, one or two, these are solicitor client privilege and I won't be answering. So you're saying you participated in discussions to provide legal opinions after the declaration of emergency. So you have provided some. What I'm saying is that you can take for granted that I did my job. That's part of the job. Mr. Degle, I understand that you may be uncomfortable, but I'm here to ask questions. Thank you, Mr. Fortin. Monsieur Fortin, I'd like to pass the floor to you for um, my round. Before you do, Chair, can I raise the point of order? You can. Um, it's highly unusual for a witness to indicate that they, and respectfully, sir, that they will not answer a question to a parliamentary committee. They refuse to answer a question. Uh, I think it is um, incumbent upon witnesses to understand the power of committees and that they have obligations to answer questions. They can answer them in a different way, but refusing to answer a question is not an option. And I would uh, ask that the committee compel a witness to answer the question that Mr. Fortin provided to him. On the same point of order, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I think uh, the Deputy Minister um, has indicated where he can. He's been very forthright. And where he cannot be forthright, he's indicated. And just for everyone's edification, when we talk about solicitor client privilege and what it covers, it can even cover the fact that an opinion exists or a number of opinions exist. And that's what Mr. Digg was was. Uh, explaining at the very end of his question. So there's a basis upon which certain things cannot be responded to. I've been at this job for seven years and I've heard many witnesses not answer certain questions sometimes because it's out of their realm of understanding or their scope or their expertise, etc. So I'll respectfully disagree with Mr. Motts. Mr. Brock? <clears throat> with all due respect <clears throat> to my colleague, Mr. Varani, that is not a legal interpretation of what has just transpired. We had a senior government official, in fact, apart from the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General, the highest senior official from the Department of Justice, refuse to answer a question posed by a committee member. Uh, without citing cabinet confidentiality, without citing solicitor and client privilege, I wholeheartedly disagree with Mr. Varani's interpretation that the mere fact that a legal opinion was prepared and delivered to the government constitutes privilege is ludicrous. We are not asking at this stage for the content or the theme. We're not asking whether or not it was delivered in person, by email, we're not asking about the date. The question posed by Monsieur Fortin was very general. Did you sign a legal opinion before the Emergencies Act was invoked? To which the witness stated very emphatically that he refused to answer the question. So I am asking, Mr. Chair, that you direct the witness to respond appropriately as opposed to a simple refusal. Mr. Chair, if I could just add two very brief points. Very briefly, please. One is that um, with respect to the, the fact that perhaps you don't want, uh, an, perhaps a, a member of the committee doesn't appreciate an answer or like an answer doesn't mean that the question wasn't answered, first point. Second point is that this committee doesn't have the power to compel a witness to answer a question, only Parliament does, only the House of Commons does. The third point is that I find this a bit um, curious insofar as last week we passed a motion that talks about production of documents, including uh, legal advice that would have been provided. And uh, that, that answer will be forthcoming. I think there was a time window put on that production motion. So perhaps some of the answers my friends are seeking will be provided when those, uh, produc when those productions are made. Senator Harder. Thank you, Chair. I just want to intervene briefly. Having uh, been a witness as a deputy minister for 16 years uh, before Senate committees and House of Commons committees. I appreciate that there are uh, times when questions are asked of a deputy that the deputy is not able to respond to in the fullness of knowledge that the questioner would wish. Uh, but I do believe the question was responded to, and that is, after all, what we're here for. Uh, so I don't see this as a question of privilege, but a distraction from our hearing. Are there any other interventions? 
Uh, Mr. Dago, can I ask you if uh, we were to go in camera, would you be willing to uh, be more forthright in uh, in answering these lines of questions? So, so I did refer to solicitor client privilege uh, when invited by Monsieur Fortin to decline to answer his question. That's the reason I'm not answering his question. Uh, and whether we're in camera or not, I don't think is going to change. But I take note of the motion that was passed a few days ago, and the government will consider uh, how it can respond uh, by the end of the month, which I think is the time frame for the response. Are you familiar um, with Standing Order 108 that constructs committees, sir? I am, yes. And that there is no bounds through which our ability as committees duly constituted by the House to send for people uh, documents and evidence? I am, yes. Are you familiar, and, and you may or may not be, but uh, I'll state for the reference of this committee that in 1891, a witness before a committee of the Senate of Canada objected to answering questions given as his reasons that he was not in any way obliged to give uh, the committee information relating to these affairs and that the uh, committee had ordered the witness to answer, but he refused. And the committee reported his refusal to the Senate and requested that action of the Senate uh, thereon. And the report of the committee was adopted by the Senate and the witness was ordered to attend the bar of the Senate. The witness was ordered by the Senate to answer the questions of the committee after he agreed to do so, he was discharged from the bar. There is jurisprudence within our system um, that these committees are supreme in their ability to investigate these issues. And so I guess I, I would Chair, like- can I just- I would like, I, I, I have the floor. I would like to just um, you know, put to you that uh, this committee has been duly constituted under those provisions and the convention of cabinet confidence is just that. It's never been conceded by the House of Commons in any kind of jurisprudence. It's just a, conven a convention. Mr. Nakfi? I was trying to just ascertain whether you're asking these questions as a member of this committee or uh, no, as a time running or as a chair. As a chair who's considering the decision of, of, of what's before us right now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Point, Mr. Chair. So. That's exactly the point I made. The jurisprudence you just referenced showed that it went from a committee to the Senate, which then compelled the witness. That's exactly the operation that would need to be followed here. Should, you, should this committee wish to pursue it, it has to go from the committee to the House of Commons to then compel a witness. That jurisprudence is established. Uh, but the second point is that cabinet confidence was not raised by Mr. Daig. Solicitor client privilege was raised. So let's please not conflate the ideas. Crown privilege? Is that what, is that what you're... Solicitor client privilege which covers not just the advice, but also the mere fact that the advice exists or the number of times the advice has been given. Which There's is aligned with Crown privilege, correct? Solicitor client privilege. Which is Crown privilege. No, no it no, is not. not. Okay. No, it is not. So it is the, is the, is the privilege. I'm going to take a moment and just recess, and I'm going to come back to this. Can I just, Chair, before you do that, please, can I just suggest that uh, uh, we just uh, put this in advance for now and consider it at some point down the road there's uh, questions that we need to ask in limited time, and I would ask that we I'll, just hold I'll it. I'll pass the chair and some, I'll uh, put my question. I have a question. Well, basically, we've heard the police did not ask for this. Emergencies act to be invoked. They had the, the powers to do it. What was it? Were they scared about the money? It was the money, wasn't it? I, I don't know. Check this scene out. Officials, thank you very much for... So well, anyway, th thanks for being here in person. We really appreciate it uh, uh, for, for you doing that. It, it means a lot. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you two quotes from your minister. At the recommendation of police, we in invoked the Emergencies Act to protect Canadians. That's quote number one. Quote number two, the invocation of the Emergencies Act was only put forward after police officials told us they needed this special power. End quote. We have heard from police officials at this committee and at other committees in this parliament. To date, none of them have indicated that they've actually asked for the invocation of the Emergencies Act. So who actually asked for it? My understanding is there is a, um, a misunderstanding of the minister's words. The minister was, was alluding to the fact that police were consulted and we're in, not just in the case of the RCMP, but other police, indicating 
as we've dis as was discussed in the prior session, well, that their powers enough. were not now, effective, and they therefore you, you asked indicated for more during your uh, during your introduction that um, you actually led some of those consultations with the RCMP, with the OPP, with Ottawa, and others. So, um, did you brief the minister on those consultations? Yes, and in some cases he was involved. Okay, so he was there. So can you provide copies of the notes taken in those cons consultations? Yes. Thank you. Um, now, do you have, do you have um, um, briefing notes then separate from, from the, the conversations with law enforcement? You said you met with the City of Ottawa officials. Uh, separate from police, do you have those as well? I have personally uh, no notes. Um, but we have records of a consultations that we undertook okay. in conversations. Th thank you. I, I appreciate that. Now, um, in your recollection, um, do, you, do you recall, was there ever any information given to the minister as fact, uh, which was later proven to be untrue, which may have influenced his decision to invoke the Emergencies Act? Which may have been untrue? No, which may have, which have proven later to be untrue that it maybe have influenced his decision to invoke the Emergencies Act? I, I, not to my knowledge. Okay, because he was at committee early on and was still talking like the arson and the apartment building was tied to the protest, and the Ottawa police has made that very clear that it was not. That was one of the incidents that I'm referring to. Um, whose decision was it ultimately, uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, that the threshold between um, peaceful protest and a state of emergency was met? Was responsible for that? Yeah. The cabinet. Cabinet was. Obviously, they got advice from somebody. Yes. And that would have been the consultations from law enforcement, or that would have been from other officials? A whole, so, a whole range of sources, but including the ones you mentioned. Okay, so obviously, uh, the information you relied upon, those documents will be made available to this committee? Um, issues of cabinet confidence are subject to the determination of the prime minister, so I can't, I can't provide. Uh, a view on that at this time. Okay, fair enough. Um, of course, they can be provided. The redactions is a different story, right? Thank you. Um, so you indicate that at the at the cabinet table, there were obviously officials, uh, you know, government officials there, and uh, was there law a law enforcement officials there besides uh, Commissioner Lucky? Um, I, again, this a, it would be a cabinet confidence, I believe, to discuss who was in the room. Well, uh, you know, um, Commissioner Lucky has already said that she met She was party to discussions um, okay. with ministers. Um, at that point, who should be making or uh, providing opinions? So you said there's people there um, advising, advising um, the cabinet to make that decision. But who, who do you think should have been there? Where, where, where's, I guess my question really should be, were the right people in the room to make that decision uh, to advise cabinet on on before the invocation was actually uh, invoked? As you know, uh, sir, they, the the Emergencies Act was invoked uh, at some time after the blockades began, and it, over the course of the two plus weeks that they were in effect, we were gathering a lot of information and doing a lot of consultation. So it was a cabinet's decision to invoke the act. How long before it was actually invoked on the 14th of February did the, the cabinet make that decision? Not long. A not day? Long, not long a week? before. Hours? It was made over the course of the weekend. Over the course of the weekend. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We will now. Don't forget to like, dislike, subscribe, and comment. Safe Space Cafe. And always, have a good